You all hear me okay? I'm not hearing myself very well. Everything good? All right. John chapter 2 is where we'll be this morning. Right, John chapter 2, we're going to begin with verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said, said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. There were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. And you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Wedding gifts. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your gospel story and the opportunity to preach it today, God. I pray that you would speak to us today. Speak to me through your word and give me the sermon you want me to preach and the power to preach it, Lord. I I ask that I would say just what you want me to and that if anything that you don't want me to say that you'd just close my mouth so I wouldn't be able to say those things. God, I pray that you'd take your word and touch our hearts and change lives today, God. Show us Jesus today, I pray. It's in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Wedding gifts. This Miracle is one of 35 miracles recorded in the gospel accounts. But this particular miracle is only recorded in the gospel of John. And John calls it the first sign. In other words, he doesn't call it a miracle. He calls it a sign because he wants us to understand there's more to what Jesus is doing here than just a magic show. we're supposed to get more out of the story than just Jesus did a cool trick by turning water into wine. There's a story here. There's a message. There's a theological truth that we're supposed to glean from this. And that's what I want us to be able to, to dig for and find this morning. It was a sign, John said. A powerful act to those who have eyes to see because it points to the reality of who Jesus is. It was more than just a miracle. Jesus here in this story is at a wedding. I think it's interesting. A lot of times we try to sanitize Jesus to the point that we don't have him being, really being a a, a human being or engaging in regular uh, activities that people would do. But yet scripture records that he went to weddings, he went to funerals, he went to dinner parties. Uh, he, he interacted with society in every legitimate activity. He did not participate in sin, but in every legitimate activity that, that human society engaged in, Jesus was a part of that. This story takes place in Cana of Galilee. Cana, Cana was about nine miles north of Nazareth, about nine miles north of Jesus' hometown. So he would have been very familiar with this area. In fact, his mother Mary uh, appears to be one of the hostesses of the, uh, of the wedding because she's the first to realize and be concerned that we've run out of wine. Weddings in Jesus' day and in that location were done differently than weddings in our day and age and in this society would be. Weddings in those 
days and in that location, they typically lasted about a week. Uh, and the host would invite as many guests as possible. You know, now it seems like the, the, uh, the trend is to try to get a smaller guest list so you, your wedding can be less expensive. But, but in those days, you invited as many guests as possible, especially influential guests like Jesus and his disciples would have been seen. Here's a, here's a local hometown boy that's kind of on the rise. He's, uh, people are starting to recognize him as a, as a great teacher, uh, someone who understood the Word of God. He now has disciples following him. So he would have, it, would have been a, it would have made a lot of sense for him to get this invitation uh, to this wedding. And those in charge of the wedding uh, would have been responsible to supply plenty of food and drink for all the guests. So no matter how many guests you invite, it's your responsibility to provide food and drink for them. And it would have been a major embarrassment to the family if you ran out of food and drink. That's why Mary seems so uh, upset and she comes to Jesus and said they've run out of wine. Well, this was a, a huge social faux pas. A, su a huge embarrassment to the family to have run out of wine. And as I said, maybe Mary here is functioning as the hostess of, of, the, of the wedding party because she seems to be the first to, to know that we're out of wine and the one that seems the most concerned about it. And so Jesus here is going to do this sign, do this miracle, and he's going to turn ordinary water into wine. But what we are supposed to understand and what we need to see for today is that, uh, that the story, the focus of the story is not on Jesus meeting a physical need. It's about Jesus meeting a spiritual need. So while Jesus took ordinary water and made it into wine, it, the story is not about uh, the fact that these people ran out of wine and so Jesus met a physical need. It's about... The, Jesus being able to meet spiritual needs and our greatest spiritual need. There's really three aspects that I see in this story that I want us to look at today. So we're going to look at the three aspects of this story. And the first is there's an aspect of emptiness. An aspect of emptiness. We're told in verse 1 that it was the third day and people have kind of gone to seed on trying to figure out what that means. Is that an allusion to the resurrection on the third day? Um, I, I don't know if, if this is a type and shadow of that. Uh, it's hard to glean that from that. To me it is. Uh, maybe it was the third day that they, since they had arrived into Galilee. Maybe it was the third day since Jesus' baptism, which is described in chapter 1. But John just simply says, it's not a main point to John, he just throws that information in there. It was the third day. And the wedding, is in, the wedding party is in full swing, and Mary comes to Jesus and says, the, the, the wine has run out. The wine pitchers are empty. And Mary is concerned only with the, the supply of wine. That's all that she's concerned about. She comes to Jesus. I think it's interesting that she comes to Jesus because she seems to know and understand that Jesus can fix the problem. But in her mind, the only problem she's thinking about is we've run out of wine and this is a huge embarrassment. Jesus can fix it. And Jesus takes this and elevates it to a sign. In other words, Jesus was going to fix the problem, but it wasn't, he wasn't going to primarily address the situation of we have no wine. He's going to take this and use it as an opportunity to, to produce a sign and demonstrate who he is as the Messiah and the Son of God. So Mary comes to Jesus and she says, we've run out of wine. And Jesus says something that almost sounds rude, but in the context, in the culture, it would not have been. He says to her, our, my translation translates it this way, Woman, 
What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. In other words, it's not the occasion to start my miracle ministry yet. That's what he's saying. In other words, you're jumping the gun. Mom, you're jumping the gun. And he seems to want to clarify what his miracle ministry is going to be about. It's not going to be about meeting physical needs. It's going to be about pointing to the greater reality of who I am as the, the Messiah and the Son of God. He says, my hour has not yet come. He's talking here about the hour of suffering, the time of the cross. He says, he, he says we're, you're jumping the gun, you're premature on that. Everything in Jesus' life pointed toward the hour, the coming hour of suffering. Everything in Jesus' life pointed toward the cross. There would be a time for miracle working. There would be a time of feeding the multitude. There would be time for healing the sick and, and raising the dead. But he says, you're, you're a little bit early on that, Mom. And then he wants to clarify, it seems, what the parameters of Jesus' obligation to his mother is. He, he makes this statement to his mother as if to say, I'm going to use this opportunity as a sign, as a miracle to demonstrate who I am and what I'm about. But mom, this is not going to be about you. This is not going to be about the fact that you're the hostess of the party and we've run out of wine. You want me to do a sign? You want me to do a miracle? I'm going to do that. But it's going to be about who I am in the Father, not who my mom is. In other words, Jesus was going to perform this miracle because it was the Father's will, not because it was His mother's will. He was directed not by His mother or not by His brothers, but by His relationship to His Father. Jesus let uh, Jesus refused to let human pressure obscure his mission. He's got, and, and there's elsewhere in the gospel story, uh, Jesus is preaching and the crowds are, are gathering him, gathering around, and, and his mother and his, his brothers, they come, they want to take him home because they thought he's lost his mind. I mean, that's, that's literally, if you read the gospel account, they. They think he's lost his mind. They think he's gone mad. And so word comes in, your mom and your, and your brothers are out coming out to see you. They want to see you. And Jesus looks around and says, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Look around you. These people who hear the word of God and do it, they're my brothers and sisters and mother. Jesus was not going to bow to human pressure or human relationships to obscure who he was in God and what God had called him to do. So here is what we're supposed to dig out of this little story. Mary comes to Jesus and she says, the wine pots are empty. And as the wine at the wedding quickly ran out, so do all human attempts to supply man's greatest need. Mary comes to Jesus with a physical need. We've run out of wine. This was a huge deal to Mary. We, we've got a need. We, we, can't, we can't meet that need. Everything's run out. It, it ran out too quickly. Well, this story isn't about wine. This and the, and the wedding guest's need for wine. It, it's about man's greatest need. There is an emptiness in the heart of man. There's an an emptiness in our soul that can't be filled by any human need. We, we, can't, we can't fill the great emptiness in us. And the world will, they, they have all kinds of solutions, but like the, the wine at, at the wedding in Cana, it quickly goes away. And pretty soon we've exhausted all attempts all human answers to fill this emptiness in our soul. 
And we're left beggars before Jesus. I've tried it all, and it's left me empty. The truth is we're spiritually empty, and only Jesus can fill that need. This is the aspect of emptiness that we're supposed to see here. Some years ago, when the boys were little, we took a trip out west and went to Old Tucson Studios in Arizona. And we went in the summertime. Uh, I learned kind of the hard way. Arizona in the summertime is not the most pleasant place to be. Uh, but we went, I don't know, June or July. It was summertime. The boys were out of school. And we went, and it was about 110 that day. And, and it's, Tucson is in the middle of the desert. There ain't nothing there but you and cactuses. And, and, and they had this old Tucson studio, and it's kind of like a little amusement park. Um, they shot a lot of old Western shows there. Shot the High Chaparral there, by the way. Um, so we're touring this, and they had like a, like a Wild West stunt show. It's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's, it's uh, you know, 110 degrees, and we're sitting in these bleachers outside, no shade, watching this Wild West stunt show. Now, if I don't know if you've heard people talk about, you know, the desert, and they'll say, well, it's hot, but it's a dry heat. An oven is a dry heat, too, you know. So it was 110, but it was a dry heat. And I'm going to tell you how dry it was. They had one old guy dressed up like a cowboy, and they had a well out there. And he would dip up a bucket of water, and he would throw that on the audience that was sitting in the bleachers. And for a split second, you're wet and you're cool, and literally, like two seconds later, you're bone dry. It was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. And I thought, that is how all of man's attempts to fill our own needs end up. We're, we're in a dry spiritual place without the Lord. And every, everything that the world throws at you, it's pleasurable for a moment. And, and before you even know it, it's gone. And all that's left is the emptiness and the loneliness and the hurting. Because only Jesus can fill this emptiness in our soul. This was a, a sign. It wasn't a magic show. It wasn't a miracle. It was a sign. And it was a sign to all who had eyes to see and ears to hear. That there is an aspect of emptiness, not just to the wine pitchers. There's an aspect of emptiness to me and to you. That nothing in the world can fill. Only Jesus can. Now, there's an aspect of emptiness. There's also an aspect of fullness here. There's an aspect of fullness. Mary comes to the servants of the wedding and she says to them, whatever he says to you, you do it. It seems that, that she understands that Jesus can fix the problem. Don't know like how he's going to do it. Mary didn't understand how he was going to do it. Didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. But she knew enough about her son Jesus to know that Jesus can fix the problem. But notice what Mary says. Whatever he tells you, you do it. Mary didn't say, now, now I'm the one in charge here. So here's, here's what, I'm going to go to tell Jesus what he needs to do. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to give orders to you of, of how we're going to fix this thing. Mary is no longer the one in control. Mary may have been the hostess. Mary may have been the one in control. But no longer is Mary in control. It's Jesus in control from here on out. And Mary completely fades from the story. You don't hear any more about Mary after this. The focus is solely on Jesus. Mary bows out, backs out, and says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And there are six stone jars, and they're empty. They're, these stone jars would have typically been used for ritual, ritual purification by the, by the Jew. Now, there's a lot of debate among scholars as to what these six jars represent, or these six pots. I mean, they're not, I say jars, I want you to understand they're, they're huge. I mean, 
uh, 20 to 30 gallons, I think is what it, it, it worked out to be, or how my translation translated it. They're huge. And some people say, well, they represent the, the law of Moses. Some people say, well, it represents religion. And there's all kinds of these ideas out there. And I, can I just say to you, I don't know if there was some great spiritual significance behind these six empty water pots. I don't know that. If there is, I don't know what it is. If I knew what it was, I'd tell you. I just don't know. But I'll tell you what I see in them. I see them as a picture of me. I see these six empty water pots as a picture of me. Because without Christ, I'm empty. And no amount of religion or legalism can truly make me whole. Only Jesus can fill me. Here I am. I'm this empty water pot. You're this empty water pot. Now I can't pour wine into myself and I can't pour, you know, the spirituality into myself because I don't have anything to draw from. The, the, the servants couldn't pour more wine into these empty pots. There wasn't none to get. They could pour water into them all day, but that they didn't have the power to turn water into wine. I can pour religion into myself. I can pour legalism into myself, but I don't have the power in and of myself to make me who I'm supposed to be. And you don't either. So you and I are very much like these water pots. We're empty without Jesus. And nothing that we pour into ourselves can fill us and make us whole. Only Jesus can do that. He says, he says to the servants, you fill these water pots. You fill them up. And it says that they filled the water pot, the, filled them up to the brim. That's means you couldn't put any more water in there that they put every drop that could fit in there in there uh, nothing could be added to the water I think there's symbolism in that when you get Jesus in your life he's going to fill your whole life Jesus doesn't want to just be added to your life that, that's not Jesus' intention Jesus doesn't want to take your crazy, messed up, empty life, filthy with sin, and just we'll just put a few drops of Jesus in there. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is going to fill you up. He's going to fill you up to the point that there ain't going to be no room for the world left in there. So that when your life completely changes, nobody can say, well, you know, old Mark, he had a pretty good life, and then Jesus finished the job. No. No. Anybody that looks at me would have to say, Mark was empty without Jesus. And nothing in the world could fill him, but Jesus filled him completely. There's an aspect of fullness here. My grandma, I called her Nanny. She was like, kind of like Granny Clampett. I mean, that's the best way I know how to describe her. Kind of like Granny Clampett. And she had all these weird little sayings. I call them nanny, nannyisms, you know. Uh, but one of the things that she would say, one of her little sayings was, full to the brim and running out the rim. You know, if she, you know, if she had, uh, you, know, uh, a, 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 you know, a full cup of coffee or whatever it was, it was, it was full to the brim and running out the rim. Well, I, I think of how John describes these water pots. He's saying that these water pots were full to the brim and running out the rim. You know, that's, that's how I want to be with Jesus. I don't want just a little bit of Jesus in me. I don't want Jesus to fill me up halfway. I want to be full to the brim and running out the rim with Jesus. There's an aspect of fullness, and there's an aspect of newness here. An aspect of newness, something new. Like the water in the pot, the problem in our heart can't be fixed by adding to it. It must be made new by Jesus. In other words, Jesus didn't take and say, okay, it wasn't going to be kind of like the, the miracle of the feeding of the multitude, where Jesus said, well, take, bring me what you know, bread and fish you got, and I'll multiply that and feed everybody. He didn't say, 
to the servants, now you bring me what little bit of wine you got left and I'll multiply that and everybody will have plenty to drink. No. Because Jesus isn't going to take the, me- the little piddling mess that is your life and, and try to fix that and-, and somehow put a patch on your life. Jesus is going to come into your life and He's going to do something completely new. He- he's going he's to start from scratch and it'll be all new. It's got to be made new by Jesus. The banquet master comes to the bridegroom. This is kind of like the head waiter, I guess you say. And he says something that, that makes a lot of sense. He says, I don't understand, I don't understand your logic here, man, friend. He says to the bridegroom, everybody else that I've ever known would serve the good wine first and then Afterwards, they'd send, send, uh, they would serve the cheap wine, the inferior wine. Now, this was common sense. He's not saying anything that wouldn't be common sense. Now, why would you serve the, the expensive wine, the good wine first, and save the cheap to last? Well, your idea was that they'd start off drinking the new wine, I mean, the, the, the good wine, the expensive wine, and then by the time they got around to drinking the cheap stuff, they would be inebriated enough that they wouldn't know the difference. It's common sense. He's not saying anything that, that wouldn't be common sense. But he said, I don't understand what you did. He said, you saved back the best for last. Now, we're not supposed to understand this to be about wine. We're supposed to be, understand this to be about Jesus. You know, I, I see great application here. In, a, in my life, in your life. We've, we've tried the world. We, we, we've tried what society says is supposed to make us happy. And like those water pots, it's left us empty. And last of all, <laughs> Jesus comes. And He's the best. Every, I'm convinced that every Christian who has a, has a true relationship with Jesus Christ would say that God saved the best for last. I've tried the world. None of it worked. It all left me empty. And then I tried Jesus. And the best is what I've tried at last. The God of the Old Testament has acted anew in Christ. That's the point of the story. God is doing a new thing. And He's not going to take the, the legalism and, and the religion of the Old Testament that was flawed and broken and try to put a patch on it and make it limp along to get you to heaven. And He's not going to take your life and your legalism and your religion and try to put a patch on, on, on a broken life so you can limp your way to heaven. He's going to trash that and start all over. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. The, God had acted new, done something new in Christ. And in verse 11, John tells us that this was a manifestation of Jesus' glory. It wasn't just a magic show. It wasn't just a miracle. It was a manifestation of His glory. It points to the time His hour would come. Jesus tells His mother, my hour hasn't come. But He does this sign that would point to the time His hour would come. That through this hour of suffering on the cross, those of us who are empty might be filled, not with the things of this world, but with the power of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. Like the old stone pot, each of us needs to be filled and changed by Jesus. We need to be made new. You come in from a hard day's work, you sit down to supper, and you notice there's nothing to drink at your, at your spot on the table. 
And so you say to your wife, I appreciate you cooking me this wonderful dinner, but what am I supposed to drink? And she says, out in the backyard, there's a, it's just rained recently, and there's a mud hole out there. You go get you a big old glass from that mud hole, and that's what you can drink. Are you up for that? You say, well, of course not. Who wants to drink muddy water? So you say to your loving bride, I really appreciate that offer, but I really don't want to drink muddy water. She said, I've got the solution. And she goes and pours a nice crystal glass of spring water, fresh. Oh, it just looks so inviting. She hands you the, the glass and she says, now, take that, this glass of clean water, and go out to that mud hole and dump this clean water in that mud hole. And this clean water will make that muddy water clean. Now you want to drink you some water out of that mud hole? You say, of course not. That's silly. You can't make something that's muddy and dirty clean by just dumping a little clean in it. You're right. It doesn't work with water, and it doesn't work with your soul. The world has it backwards. The world has it wrong. We have this, this emptiness. We have this dirtiness in our soul because of our sin. And the world says, oh, well, we can fix that. Just take a little bit of religion and dump that in there. Just take a, a little bit of following the rules and put that in there. Just take a little bit of love thy neighbor as thyself and put that into your life, put that into your soul, put that into practice, and it'll make the ugly soul clean. So we try a little bit of that. And it leaves us as empty and broken as we were before we even started. But now we're worse. Because it seems like before we tried religion, before we tried legalism, we at least knew that we had a problem. We at least knew that we were sinners. Now we've listened to the lies of the world that say, oh, well, you've got religion. You follow the rules. So you must be okay. You're clean. Don't worry about it. But in our heart, in our bed at night when we lay down and put our head on the pillow and there's just nobody there but us, we know in our heart it isn't true. We know in our heart we're empty. We've got an emptiness that only Jesus can fill. We've got an ugliness that only Jesus can clean. And I can't just put a little bit of religion in my life and expect to be full and clean. Jesus is going to fill me to the rim and to the brim and running out the rim with him. And he's not going to take my old religion and my old legalism and my old life and just put a patch on it. He's going to fill me up with him and do something brand new. There's an aspect of newness here. I, I think it's interesting that it says the disciples saw his glory. His he manifested His glory and His disciples believed in Him. I think it's interesting, not everybody that saw this sign, not everybody that saw this miracle understood who Jesus was. Those who saw His glory were those who believed. His disciples believed He was the Christ. They believed that He was the Son of God. And they saw His glory because they believed. God is doing a new thing through Jesus Christ. And He wants to do it in you. Are you willing to surrender your emptiness to Him? Are you willing to surrender your brokenness to Him? You say, God, I, I'm not asking you to put a patch on my life. I'm not asking to, to fill my life with meaningless religion. I'm asking you, Jesus, would you fill me with you? Full to the brim running out the rim, and do something new and make me clean as only you can do. Is that your prayer today? Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this, this story, for this sign, God, that shows us who Jesus is and our need for him. 
God, I pray as we come now to this time of invitation and decision that you would touch our hearts. God, that you would lead us to the decisions you'd have us to make. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.